So what is dissociation? Whenever people talk about trauma and the effects of trauma, dissociation is invariably something which comes to the clinical table. Dissociation we can think of as uh, one model would be primary, secondary and tertiary dissociation. So the first thing that we need to acknowledge is that dissociation in and of itself is not abnormal. So primary dissociation is a sort of dissociation that most, if not all, of the listeners will be familiar with. You maybe traveled in a car, bus, or subway, and all or part of the time, you haven't been aware of every moment of the journey. And that's a pretty common experience. And this is what we call primary dissociation. Dissociation, we can think of as a word as disassociation. So a functioning, normally functioning brain is a process of association, bringing things together, making links. Dissociation is the opposite of that. Things are disconnected, things are left unattached. And so trauma often has a dissociative force to it, a dysregulating force to it. Primary dissociation, however, is pretty normal. However, whenever we think of secondary dissociation, we're starting to look at now where it's starting potentially to move into more pathological state. But again, you'll see that elements of it are normal. So secondary dissociation is really a separation between the participating part of the self, or sometimes referred to as the ego. So the participating ego being separated from the observing ego. So there's a part of me having a conversation now, talking about this, and there's a part of me that is aware that I'm having this conversation. So those two parts of me exist. For the therapist, the therapist is going to enhance and build skills for their observing ego because they always want to be able to be participating in the conversation in the clinical session, but also having another part of them thinking, what do I need to do next? What am I noticing? What am I aware of? So that distinction is quite normal for therapists and something that actually we seek to build upon, but it can become very distinct and very separate in a dysfunctional way. And that's where we then consider it um, obviously more relevant to the clinical picture. Tertiary dissociation, however, is where we have distinct ego states that exist as separate entities. At its most extreme form, we now refer to it as dissociative identity disorder, um, the older name being multiple personality disorder. Um, there's lots of functional neuroimaging which demonstrates that this is um, something which can be measured and something that if we have a person pretending to have um, distinct personalities, that their brain state and the person acting that is very different from a person with an actual traumatic dissociative state. And we can demonstrate that with functional neuroimaging that they are distinct and they are distinctly different. So dissociation can be thought of as that spectrum, primary, secondary and tertiary. But what we're always looking at is the effect that that's having on the clinical presentation in front of us. And so therefore that's how we will then focus our attention. What we've got to bear in mind is that the force that is causing dissociation is the trauma. So by processing the trauma that we reduce the dissociative force and that helps the person then to become more integrated. However, we should bear in mind the work of Professor Maurice Rahm and his uh, wife, Sandra Asher, who set up the Hearing Voices Network. We've typically thought of a well person who does not hear voices and a sick person who hears voices. But one of the big things that's come out of the Hearing Voices Network, which Professor Rahm invites us to think about, is that actually we can have a well person who hears voices. And so instead of looking at Rick Clough's criteria where we would be working towards a unitary person, that sometimes people do exist as multiples with a host um, who interacts with the world, but they still have these persisting separate states within themselves, but that can also be functional. So I think we need to think of those three different pieces. A person who hears voices, but who is well, is something that we need to consider in the clinical picture.